and rivers of New Zealand comes Meridian Energy. Owned by all New Zealanders and proud to present their stories in our people, our century. of the nation. They've changed dramatically over the last hundred years. Once marriage was for life, divorce a disgrace. Families were often large, ruled by fathers as head of the household. Now the roles of men and women have merged. Families have become smaller, more flexible and democratic. Relationships between parents and children have relaxed. Families changed as the moral rules we live by changed. New Zealanders spent much of the 20th century trying to suppress or control sexual behaviour. Now our lives are based on individual preference and lifestyle choice. The McGibbon family. The first generations were stern, puritanical Presbyterians. Discussion of sex was taboo, though there was plenty of proof of its existence with families of 10 or 12 children. Today, the younger McGibbons make lifestyle choices that would have shocked their ancestors. The Fayens have been West Coasters for a hundred years. The coast was a tough man's world, where mates could be more important than wives. Elsie had to put up with a violent marriage while she bore nine children. Acceptance of divorce has made the lives of her children easier, and premarital pregnancy isn't the disaster it once was. Family life has always been different among Maori. Families are wider and more fluid. There's less humbug about keeping on the straight and narrow. The Kaas are a large Ngāti Paro whānau living on the east coast who merge traditional Māori and modern Pākehā ways. Kēri and Wikuki Ka grew up in a family of 12, but both have been reluctant to marry. Kēri has many nieces and nephews. In her world, the whole whānau cares for its children. Three families, a century of changing values, which is overtaken by incredibly diverse ways of being together. Rangitukia, just south of East Cape, is the heartland of the Kahafu of Natiporo. The modern cars migrated to the cities, but Kiri has given up her Wellington Teachers College career and returned to her rural roots. Her nephew Peter has come to visit at the old car homestead. Who broke my gate? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> so, to your so has her brother Wikuki and his wife Sylvia. Oh. Oh. If you had been two hours earlier, you could have cleaned the bathroom. <laughs> Wikuki and Kiri's great grandfather, Harold Carr, an English born interpreter for the first Maori land court, married Imidi Natai in 1865. By 1914, one of their sons, Brannigan, Wikuki and Kiri's grandfather, had fathered 17 children by several mothers. He was quite frightening, old Brannigan. He was bald, and he'd often forget to put his teeth in. So he, he was quite terrifying. He was tall and pale. Uh, an immigrant from Yorkshire. He didn't look that Maori at all, really compared with the others. He doesn't speak much English. Maori was his first and then chief language. On his mother's side, he was descended from the loyalists during the Ho Ho outbreak. The 1860s Ho Ho rebellion split the tribe down the middle. We cook his grandmother's family fought with the rebels. His grandfather's family was Kūpapa, fighting on the government side. Their marriage was political arranged by the elders to cement the peace. And 
there were many such marriages to, to heal the breach. Because the Ho-Ho rebellion uh, at home in 1868 was virtually a, a civil war. The remarkable thing is that, um, you know, people liked each other and loved each other dearly. They were long, strong marriages. Arranged marriages were common, but so were love matches. If a couple slept together, they were regarded as married. And they were expected to stay together. There's no question of uh, the man having a new girl every night. It would uh, disgrace the mother of the family. He was always scarier on that wall. Yeah, and this is, this is your great, great, great grandfather. Chiefs often had several wives, showing they had the status to afford it. The Ka's ancestor, Ihaka Fanga, had five. Some high-born women also had several husbands, and in some areas had other rights. The right to leave the marriage was the female right, not a male one. And especially if the woman was from a high-born family, that was her prerogative if she wanted to change husbands. Brannigan's son, Tippy, Kerry and Wikuki's father, refused his arranged marriage. His elders betrothed him to a distant relative, but he had given his heart elsewhere. So it turned out, had the woman. She was more interested in some other guy, and he was more interested in some other girl. And it never worked. It was never going to work, because if he did, didn't object, she would have, you know. Instead, Tippi married his sweetheart Sophie, Hohi of Nati Kahungunu. To Brannigan Carr, her new father-in-law, Sophie would always be the foreigner. Grandfather Carr couldn't stand our mother. He used to call her that Purari foreigner. Purari was his version of bloody. And he, because he had this um, appalling attitude that women were to be, you know, the the bearers of children, the housekeepers, the bread makers, the hewers of wood, the carriers of water, that was their place. And what he acquired was a feisty feminist woman from Ngāti Kahungunu, who had been raised with a totally different set of values. She would talk about how she was down on her knees, scrubbing this great huge kitchen floor in the old homestead, and grandfather just marched across the floor. So she picked up the scrubbing brush and threw it at him. You know, which is, when you think about it, in those times would have been a really outrageous thing to have done. And he was horrified because nobody had ever thrown anything at her. Her, what did Grandma Matawa do? And she said, she watched and just nodded. Sophie and Tipi had 12 children. Tipi, a dairy farmer who was to become a minister of the church, had had a classical education. Tipi taught his brood haka while they worked in the kumara patch, and then coached them in Shakespeare during the milking. Wikuki and Kiri grew up across the fence from the school, but despite the encouragement from home, they did not remember their school days with fondness. We were punished for jabbering. That's what they call speaking Maori. And the Māori teachers we had, <coughs> who came to teach here, they were even more strict they than, weren't much better, than the yeah. Pākehā teachers. Yeah. It was like they were sort of going to outrun everybody else to show people how to discipline children. But the most awful punishment dished out for people who couldn't do their homework, couldn't explain themselves in English, was we had these lift-up lids on our desks, and they'd make you put your desk lid up, you'd put your head inside the desk and then they banged the lid on it. Tipika had learned Latin and lamented that his children were not getting the same foundation in their education. Those were the days when Latin was compulsory, you know, especially in private schools. And he never stopped telling us how our standard of English was lower than his because we never studied Latin. <coughs> and he said, you people have no sense of grammar these days. Not like in my day. <laughs> Learning had to compete with hard physical work around the farm. Kids milked the cows in the morning before they went to school. We did the kumaras after school. And on the weekends, we worked all the time. 
Every Saturday morning, we hitched a horse to the cart, went down to the beach to load up driftwood. Two cartloads a day. During the football season, we could get our second cartload in by two o'clock. So we were back in time to watch the game. But uh, otherwise, we never got back to almost sunset. We weren't allowed to do it on Sundays. We were, we were quite strict about that. And those households that still did it on Sundays were considered godless and beyond the pale or whatever. Bringing up the children was a task shared with the wider whanau. Other parents were involved, the uncles, the aunties. I mean, you're part of the extended family. They had as much right to tick you off as your, your own parents did. If you get squimmed at and shouted at, well, you just go off up the road and stay at some other auntie's house till things have cooled down, then you trot home. You, you get used to the fact that the whole world is watching you. You know, and, and that you need to perform to their expectations. I think the strongest thing is, is the sense of belonging. You know where you belong. Down in West Coast coal mining country, another family put down deep roots. This family had their passage paid from Wales in return for being bonded to the Westport Coal Company. Four generations later, they are coasters still. The West Coast are mostly closed. This is all that's left of Burnett's face near Deniston. Seven of Beatrice Fayen's eight children return to the place where their mother was born. This coal looks as if it's been there for a fair while. Cyril and June's mother, Beatrice, was the second to last child of Lizzie and Ned, who arrived from Wales in 1905. Burnett's face was a raw makeshift settlement, dumped down on either side of the rope railway built to transport coal out to Deniston, and then down to the coast. Beatrice often told her daughters, June and Elsie, stories about living at Burnett's face. Oh, pretty rough. They only had a two-roomed little hut, really. They had to carry water from the creek. It would have been the girls' jobs to carry all the water. Imagine. For washing, the toilets, cooking, all carted up by buckets. Imagine trying to get that, that coal trucks whizzing past, up and down, all particular about their washing in those days. All their frilly lacy underdrawers and petticoats and hair ribbons and all that. Oh, it must have been terrible. What I mean, they were living right beside the railway tracks and there was nowhere for the children to play. I can imagine the horror it must have been for her, knowing her little girls were running, roaming around the railway tracks. One of those little girls was Elsie's mother, Beatrice. Beat, as she was known, was one of nine children. She grew up to have eight of her own. Large families were the norm, especially if you were working class. Only middle class people could afford the potions and rubber condoms on sale at chemist shops. For working people, contraception was a makeshift, homemade affair. This 84-year-old lady, dear lady, and I was talking to her about what happened, you know, and she said, and of course, you know, June, there was no contraceptives in those days. And she said, we used a silk hanky. And I thought, well, you know, when I told my girls, well, they, oh, Mum, how could you? Said, Don't be crazy. But yes, yes, that was, that was about it. Beat grew up on the coast and married a coaster, Sonny Fayen, a returned soldier. Sonny got a job with the railways. He was a great family man and would often go to sleep with the latest baby across his chest. Baby slept in bed with mum and dad. There was no cot. Babies were in bed until they were old enough to go into bed with the others. And I felt that gave us a tremendous sense of security. But of course, the four girls slept all in one bed and the two boys had a bed. They had to sleep in a single bed together. And, uh, but it, 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 we didn't worry. I mean, if, if you were in bed at night and you had a bad dream, there was somebody there beside you. The West Coast was a tough man's world, but at home there was never a cross word between Sonny and Beat. Although demonstrations of affection were not the done thing in front of the children. 
Well, I can remember when Dad was going off to hospital or something one day and he, and he came and gave Mum a kiss on the cheek. And Iris and I, Mum, that's the second time we've seen Dad kiss you. You know, <laughs> it was oh, a big thing. In the Depression years of the 1930s, the Fyans moved to different parts of the country so that Sonny could get work. Everyone in the family had to do their bit to put food on the table. That was grim. And the boys used to go caddying at the golf course, and they'd get paid a shilling a day or something like that. And Mum would be waiting at the gate for the shilling when they come home, and she'd hand it over. Well, it was needed. All but one of the Fyan kids left school at 11 or 12 to start their working lives. Children had to grow up fast. June and her sisters had little preparation for the more intimate aspects of boy-girl relations. We just didn't know anything about it. And um, I, all my mother said to me once, you know, she said, oh, men don't like second-hand goods. That was my sex education, you see. And I, I went, walked home with a few boys at odd times and we'd have a bit of a kiss and a cuddle at the gate. And when I think back now, I was probably a bit naughty because I probably stirred them up a bit and then I'd say, well, I'm going in now, you know. <laughs> but totally, totally ignorant of, you know, the uh, emotional thing. <laughs> June avoided pregnancy, but thinks she was fortunate to get away with it. I mean, oh, I don't know whether I should be saying this, but it was probably just a bit of sheer good luck that I probably... We didn't really fully um, go the whole way, but, you know, uh, once I'd got that um, entanglement, I, I felt then that I, he was the man I was to marry. I have this feeling, at my, it's only my personal opinion, that once a man puts his mark on a woman, you know, to me, that's, that's it. Further south in the Matara Cemetery near Gore lie the ancestors of Bruce McGibbon and his nephew John. The McGibbon family arrived in Dunedin from Scotland in 1849. Retailing was their trade, and they founded stores in Dunedin, Gore and Matara. But the family patriarch, John McGibbon, wanted more from his fellow townspeople than their custom. He was also involved with the Free Church, Free Church of Scotland, which was a breakaway from the Presbyterian Church. And uh, they had a mission to go out and form a colony in Dunedin. And in fact, they saw themselves as the new Pilgrim Fathers. The Anglicans uh, were a great problem. They were known as a little enemy because they brought other ideas in and spoiled the idea of this little Puritan settlement. John McGibbon's son, Thomas, proved to be as pious as his father. He would head the whole procession of McGibbons down the central aisle of, of Knox Church. They'd get to the pew that the family had rented, and uh, he would stand at the outside, take his top hat off, the family would file past him, then he would finally sit down and put his smoker's cap on, and he would lean forward and pray vigorously. They had a down on things like gambling. They didn't go in for fun in a big way. Um, they were certainly let their hair down with a bit of music and dancing later on in the century. But no, generally it was a fairly quiet and austere lifestyle. But they, they did like to sing the old Scotch songs around the piano. There was a lot of that sort of thing. And even, even dancing um, reels and so on. My great grandmother used to play piano while everyone danced the reels. So, so they, they weren't totally unbending. Bruce McGiven, Thomas's grandson, grew up in Matara. His father, Archie, ran the local store. By the early 1900s, the strict old Presbyterian ways were relaxing, but only slightly. He wasn't as narrow in his attitude like my grandfather, Thomas McGibbon, or my great-grandfather. But I still remember as, as kids, we weren't allowed to uh, read comics on Sunday. In church, hellfire and brimstone sermons threatened sinners with eternal damnation. At home, disobedient boys received more immediate. She had a feather duster with a great big long bamboo handle. A hiding, and if we got up to something she couldn't solve, Dad took us in into the boys' room. He gave us a hurry up, and that's when the uh, the old uh, strop, the leather strop, 
for the cut froze razor when they used to sharpen it. But we, when we knew we were going to get a hiding, we put the school journals down our trousers. <laughs> he cottoned onto that after a while. We had to drop our tweeds and knew we got it around the bare backside. <laughs> But it never did you any harm. I, I'm rather amused that the attitude of several, the people today on on that attitude, it never did us any harm. I think it builds your character, and you know right from wrong. Pubs were definitely on the wrong side of the ledger. Early century prohibition, the movement to abolish the liquor trade, was strongest in Southland and Otago. The alliance of feminists and the churches had won voting rights for women. Now they also tried to rid New Zealand of the demon drink. At a very young age, Bruce signed a pledge that he would never let alcohol pass his lips. I've signed on in there as a member of the Band of Hope and signed the pledge. How old? Oh, probably about eight. Very much. I think quite a few McGibbon family members signed the pledge. It didn't necessarily mean that they didn't drink because there seemed to be a distinction among the Scots between the medicinal uses of Scotch in particular and overindulgence. I mean, the earliest McGibbon, old John Senior, every Sunday night when he had the, the Bible reading with the family, I believe that if he heard the bell saying someone wanted to be ferried across the river to buy some grog, he would drop the Bible and attend to business. This practical approach was continued by John's grandson, Archie. Bruce's father kept a supply of liquor discreetly tucked away in his bedroom. He was strict, but he always uh, entertained his, his men friends up at the front of the house in his bedroom. He'd take them up there and shout for them up there. Well, that was way back, way back. Born just after the First World War, Bruce McGibbon grew up in this house in Matara and started work in his father's shop. As a teenager, he received little help with personal relationships. There was nothing discussed uh, uh, with us between our parents on sex, nothing at all. You got it, you learnt it by uh, word of mouth or uh, mixing with other people. Of course, there was no pills or anything like that in those days, but there were, there were the condoms. You, you'd think I was a rake because if I was going to say to you I was using condoms all the time, but it was... Uh, I think if I remember correctly, there used to be about half a crown for a packet of four. Even in Puritan Otago, human nature being what it is, experimentation before marriage did happen. Ah, yes, to a degree. You wouldn't go to bed with a woman with a drop of a hat. Just like, uh, uh, just as easy, easy, easy today, I reckon I was born in the wrong generation. I missed a lot of fun. <laughs> World War II saw the old taboos about sex under attack. Women were out in the world, and romance provided a distraction from the horrors of war. The Second World War was a huge upheaval, felt at home as much as in the battle zone. While the Kiwi troops were away, New Zealand hosted thousands of American Marines for training and rest and recreation. They brought Yankee glamour and dollars to women who had found a new independence when they were manpowered into jobs vacated by their men. The nightlife blossomed. The Fayenne household was now in Auckland. Sonny, still in his 40s, was dying of Hodgkin's disease. Beatrice started taking in washing from American GIs to bring in money. Daughter Elsie was helping at home, and that's how she met and fell in love with a handsome GI. They were about to get married when Jean was sent off to the Pacific War. It wasn't meant to be because he was shot in the back. I was a sniper. Yeah. It was really sad. He was a lovely boy, really was. But wasn't meant to be. While Elsie was still grieving for Jean, she was asked out by a Kiwi called Stan Gear. Well, he made sure that night that I missed the last bus and the last train home. Don't worry, he said, I'll take you round to my, where I live at my Aunt Lil. She won't mind, she'll give you a bed for the night. Yeah, she wasn't even there. 
so you can see what happened. I was seduced. So I went home and I just thought, what do I do now? If I'm pregnant, what's going to happen? I couldn't land that on my mother. And that's how I got married. I lived 17 years with a man I didn't love. Elsie and Stan moved back to the West Coast. Here, life was very different and rules were made to be broken. Publicans simply ignored the law that closed pubs at six o'clock. The prohibitionists had complained that men would spend their wages in bars and neglect their families. And so it was in the case of Stan. And he spent all his nights in the pub. Never come home until the pub shut and he was all... Contraception, Elsie had nine children in 13 years. If Elsie resisted, Stan was violent. If he couldn't get his own way. Trouble is, there was no such thing as a rape of a man's wife in those days. Pity. I could have had a divorce over and over and over and over and over, and over again if I had to be. Children were expected to provide all the personal fulfillment women needed in the post-war years. There was little understanding of women's sexual needs. As breadwinners, men were the boss in the family, and the law gave men conjugal rights that required women to provide sex no matter what they were feeling. Until 1985, there was no such thing as rape within marriage. That was the olden days concept. A woman's role was just to be submissive to the husband was not expect, not supposed to enjoy it. You, were, you weren't a good woman if you enjoyed sex. For Elsie Gear, sex was something to be endured. Only once did she experience pleasure. Once. Once in my whole lifetime, and that was after my mother died. I went into total shock. And I met up with a man in Blenheim. He's a rough Irish, rough diamond, Irishman. But it was somebody I needed at the time. And that's the only time in my life that I ever knew what sex was all about. When Elsie and family moved back to Auckland, Stan continued his heavy drinking. He preferred the all-male world of the bars to home. It was more peaceful when he wasn't home because Stan's violence spilled over onto the children. Well, what finally made me... Didn't get to the hotels as frequently. Wasn't coming home. And if I forcibly, and I got just couldn't handle too much more. He came home one Father's Day. He walked into the lounge and nobody took any notice of him. Ah, oh, great Father's Day it is, isn't it? Sandra turned around and looked at him. She said, well, you're not much of a father anyway, are you, Dad? Well, he just grabbed her and he started punching her. Even though I was his pet, I had to he was the one that he picked on. I was the one he picked on when he'd come home drunk, yeah. And I went and grabbed him by the hair, and I tried to pull him off her. He said, the more, he looked up, he said, the more you hurt me, the more I'll hurt you. And I had to let him go. And he started punching me and he wouldn't stop. Of course, when mum come in, she got on the back of him, and, and he just said, the, the more you, you hit me and hurt me, the more I'll hurt her. For Elsie, it was the finish. She packed up her children and returned to the West Coast. And off we went. Me, nine kids, two suitcases and a vacuum cleaner. Why the vacuum cleaner? 
I don't know why, really. Only because it was the last new thing I ever bought. And I had to walk out and leave everything else. So I took the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> McGibbon, his relationship with his father, Bunty, was almost formal. My dad was a bit austere. He was a very shy man, really. That relationship wasn't helped by his father being his teacher at school. I, I certainly got strapped by my father on many occasions uh, at Ardgown School. Well, I didn't enjoy being strapped by dad at all, and I, and I doubt very much whether dad enjoyed strapping me too, and there was a bit of this, so this is hurting you more than it's hurting, hurting me more than it's hurting you, son. Um, <laughs> but I think it was embarrassing for both of us, but uh, my father felt he had to, he didn't want to appear as though I was a teacher's pet. Kiwi men felt most comfortable around their mates, and they avoided talking about deeply felt emotions. I certainly would never heard my father uh, talk on any emotional level about what he felt about anything. Uh, it didn't even really extend to showing a direct overt affection to either my mother or we as children. At the same time, he wasn't totally distant uh, and we always knew we had his support. So uh, we knew, and, and I guess in behind that, there was a feeling there was love in behind the whole thing. But it wasn't worn on the sleeve. I think that had some effects on me when I became an adult because um, I find it hard to be overtly uh, emotional um, with other people, or, uh, okay, in private, but um, certainly in terms of public displays of affection um, and emotion on things, yes, I think uh, I've got a bit of a monkey on my shoulder from those days. As far as family planning uh, and my parents was concerned, I, I, it was something that was never discussed. However, I know that they use condoms because every so often we children would, would, uh, be, would crawl under the bed and find these used condoms and wonder what the hell they were, so, which caused great embarrassment to our parents, so, uh, so I happen to know that they used condoms. In the mid-1960s, jazz was the cool thing to do. John was at Varsity in provincial Palmerston North and playing in a jazz band when he met Liz. When I first saw her, I thought she was a mighty fine-looking woman and, um, and I liked the look of her. Uh, I got to talk to her and uh, found we got on very well. We were always very comfortable wasn't very long before we found that there was a physical attraction as well. I very much intended to get married and have children. In fact, it was my ambition. And probably I was at university to um, get a more interesting sort of bloke. Yeah, unfortunately, there, there was a universe to it, to be honest. Um, but it, it was marriage or nothing. And particularly, her parents would never have tolerated um, a situation where we lived together at all. I mean, they had no idea what we were getting up to anyway, I don't think, and uh, in fact, it could have been quite dangerous if her father had found out. In the late 1960s, a tidal wave of social change began to sweep through the Western world. Every dearly held social value was up to scrutiny. Make love, not war, was the slogan of a generation, and the pill made it possible first time women could have sex without fear. Liz and John were already married when the free love revolution arrived and they were ready to try the new form of contraception. The medical profession was not so welcoming. I certainly discussed the pill with the doctor and this doctor was not a Catholic but he got very harumphy about it and felt even then that it was the husband's business to look after the wife and any children that may have come along. The pill revolutionised people's lives. I think it probably revolutionised the lives of an awful lot more men. The expectation previously was that you asked, the woman probably said no, um, and that was pretty much the way things were. They understood that women were terrified of pregnancy. Once women no longer had to be terrified of pregnancy, um, then they rather wondered what on earth they were making a fuss about if they said no. Although sex between men and women became easier, men found it harder to accept other changes to their domestic roles. I guess in those early days I was a pretty unliberated male. Looking back on it, probably still am to some extent. Uh, you can't shake these things off entirely. But, um, 
No, Liz was the one who was home and she would have done most of the housework. I gave her clean the loo. Many men found adjusting to feminism difficult, but not we cookie car. He was comfortable going with the flow. You had to watch how you talked, for one thing. It's like, it's just really no different from your partner being converted to a different church. And suddenly, maybe you can't swear anymore. You can't use JC's name in vain anymore, and, you know. At the end of the swinging 60s, we Cookie Car was in Sydney, acting in TV cop shows by day and hanging loose by night. Marijuana was the drug of the times. We were constantly busted by the cops. We used to grow that stuff in our garden. The grass. Quite uh, blatantly. To extract the juice, put it in the electric frying pan to dehydrate it so you got something like a hash. Yeah. Oh, great stuff. And we put that in our pepper grinder, sprinkle it on our salads. You know, wonderful. Drugs were the element of the hippie lifestyle that shocked conventional society. But hippie values went much deeper. The hippies sought a simpler way of life, rejecting the traditional family in favor of communal living. Their so-called counterculture had much in common with the Maori way of life. When I drifted into the flower power scene, and then later what they called counterculture, I found that highly offensive because I always felt they were talking about my culture. We don't call it a counterculture. This tradition of sharing and, you know, uh, being a... Now, Hua Manu is the PC Māori for eggs, but there's a transliteration for eggs. The wee cookie's is... sister, Keri, who had watched her mother Hua exhaust Manu. herself raising 12 children. Oh. Feminism meant she could choose a career in teaching and boyfriends her mother didn't approve of. Don't come home with a baka and don't come home with a cat. And one summer I came home with a failed priest. <laughs> but for me, a permanent relationship was never an option. Because I wanted to do other things. I wanted the freedom to choose to write, um, to join committees. And because the feminist movement was sweeping through, you didn't necessarily have to be part of a relationship to be of worth. That's always been at the back of my mind. I want to be free to do other things. If you want to be really PC and use posh Māori, have hua whakau. Coast, Elsie Fayen and her nine children were struggling with poverty and prejudice. It began in this house, several miles outside Westport. In 1960, Elsie was 35 and there was no domestic purposes benefit only the family benefit to feed and clothe nine children. She took out a maintenance order against Stan, but his checks didn't always arrive. I always made sure I had plenty of flour, baking powder, golden syrup and tomato sauce in the cupboards. And if the check didn't arrive by lunchtime Friday, out would come the flour, whip up a big batch of fried scones, which luckily the kids all liked. So it was either fried scones with golden syrup or fried scones with tomato sauce. My poor old mother, she'd get bills. We had to go down to the shop and get yeah. get the bread and bits and pieces from Pat O'Day's shop. He'd give me a bill and I'd take it home and my mum would put it straight in the fire. The boys used to go to bed fully clothed because if they took them off, they may not find them next morning. Somebody else might have took them off, see? First up, best rest. Yeah, my big wedding day. Mm. Biggest mistake of my life. As a teenager, Sandra's sister Lynn blamed her mother for having to go without. I can remember in, in later years, mother being a lot of conflict because we would ask for money to go to the movies or to go to the swimming bars, etc. And she just didn't have the money to give us. But we didn't understand, of course, that she didn't have the money to give and we would be I, I mean I myself would be very very angry with her. I'm dyslexic and I think a lot of that was because of, of the fighting and the things that happened around me and see mum didn't really have a lot of time 
to spend with us older older ones because she had so many other little ones to to look after as well and and I just found that we just sort of come along rolled along through life and I felt as if I'd been left out you know quite a lot of places in my life in yeah. It wasn't on to be a solo parent in those days. You were really, really looked down on. And then it even branched onto my children. A lot of the neighbourhood's children were not allowed to play with those gear kids. Even now, you know, we can be out and about somewhere and somebody will say, oh, you're not a part of that gear family, are you? Yeah. Uh, we were known as the poor, the gears, the poor people. Elsie could not talk easily to her daughters about intimate matters. But teenagers were hearing new ideas about sexual freedom. And the gear girls, like everyone else, were experimenting. I hate to say before marriage, but everybody did in those days. You just were careful, very careful. You just didn't do everything. Women's liberation was changing the lives of some women but Kiwi women generally were marrying younger than ever and having their babies early. Like a mother, Lynn didn't believe you could get away with having sex before marriage. It was one of several reasons why Lynn walked up the aisle with Craig. More so she expected because we had been engaged, of course, for two years. And also because he had been the boyfriend from 13. And, and of course, in my time, once something happened, that was it, and you married the partner. And so there was the big white wedding. Oh, it was lovely, I mean, to have a big white wedding, and, and yes, for sure. This was going to be the method, not, not like my mum, of course. I wasn't going to be poor. I wasn't like we were poor. I certainly was not going to meet, marry a man who drank, was a drinker, and, and of course, that he wasn't going to be violent like my father. Um, and, of course, I was going to have these perfect children and we were just going to be one big happy family. Lynn's sister Sandra also had her eye on the man she thought was Mr Wright. In those days, he was a really nice chap. I really loved him. Gosh, it's heavy. We went together for about four years, but my mum wouldn't let me marry him because he had a bad temper. He had a violent temper when roused. He wouldn't, he never hurt Sandra, but he'd punch things, break things. Sandra thought she knew better. Her father Stan gave her away when she married at 18, with all the trappings. She had three children, and then the world fell apart. He met another lady, and too much to my horror, and hurt. And he went off with another woman, and I just, carried on bringing up my children. Sandra was devastated. Yes, yes, I had a breakdown. Mm. Sandra's daughter, Leanne, was badly affected by the marriage breakup. I hate him because of what he's done to my mum and he's just wiped out my, my, um, me and my brothers and our children. That's when I went downhill, yeah. I went downhill in school. I went downhill with my attitude, personality, yeah, everything. And I ended up leaving when I was 16 and got into the drug world and everything. And yeah, I blame my father for all of that. Because it hurt so much, you just got to block it out somewhere along the line. Lynn's marriage was no more successful than her sister Sandra's. By the mid-1970s, divorce was becoming more acceptable. Feminism had raised women's expectations of relationships, and Lynn had had enough. She left her first husband and had a child to someone else. It was that she found real happiness. Uh, certainly when I met him, there was just the chemical thing that I didn't know could exist. Yeah, and it was just lovely. I couldn't, just couldn't believe. I just knew it was right. God is good. Hooray, God, I've got it. <laughs> Dave, Sandra's second husband, is a lay preacher. He and Sandra found security in a marriage arranged by the church elders. And when I turned round and spotted Dave, I thought, oh no, oh no, because my pastor had prayed, please, Lord, bring Sandy a tall, dark, handsome man into her life. And of course, I got this little short, bald-headed man. <laughs> I really didn't want to get married, but he loved me. 
I've been really, really lucky because I'm glad that that man held on and waited for me because I really do love that man. Bachelor into his 50s. Eight years ago, he married Sylvia, a young German woman he met while filming in Berlin. The bachelor was finally caught. What are you reading, Ben? Oh, this American thriller. Mm. All my relationships were fly by nights. You know, get out before it gets too serious. Move. <laughs> you know, change flats, change suburbs, change cities. Uh, I just like being like that. And then, I suppose because I got old. And uh, I can't run anymore. Rangitukio was the place we and Kerika returned to for renewal. In the early 1980s, they were both in Wellington, Kiri teaching and we acting in films and TV. He also became the family historian, passing on his knowledge of Maori traditions. And for Tukutuku, if uh, married couples wanted to do it, because over here, men, they weren't allowed to do it with their wives, because uh, otherwise they brought their domestic rows to the, to the work. <coughs> So if a married man wanted to do it, he had to do it with somebody else's wife. <laughs> Peter Carr is the son of Mary Carpenny, we and Kerry's sister. His parents' relationship was short-lived. Then, when Peter was three, his mother died. The rest of the whanau took over his upbringing, a traditional practice called whāngai, which for many years was not recognised by welfare authorities. My grandparents took over the role of uh, bringing me up. There was a bit of a, a legal wrangle there because um, the courts didn't accept, didn't acknowledge the, the, the Māori concept of whāngai. So I had to be legally adopted by my grandparents who were in their 60s at the time. The cars valued education, and Peter, like his uncles, was sent to boarding school. When his grandparents became too old to cope, he lived with his uncles. Then at 15, he was sent to Wellington to live with his aunt Kerry, who was single, flatting with friends and teaching. I didn't think it was going to be easy because um, Peter was just 15 and um, adolescence um, with whom I was working at the time are difficult anyway. And Kiri was right. Peter turned out to be a handful. It had stressful moments like um, Peter getting extremely drunk uh, because he didn't understand about uh, alcohol and sort of just guzzled it all. The kind of stupid stuff you do when you are a 16-year-old. And the drugs thing, too, used to scare us, because while we knew about drugs, those of us who'd grown up in the 60s, we didn't know about the alarming power of the, the new stuff that was coming into the country. You sort of know these things in the abstract, but in person, when they happen to your children, or the children in your care, um, it's really scary. 16th birthday, I was sitting there and I was unwrapping all my presents. And there was this one person about this big. I thought, oh, gee, it's really light. I wonder what it is. And I opened it up and it was a packet of Rothmans. And uh, sort of staring at this thing and frightened. And she goes, good, now you can buy your own instead of stealing mine. Oh, oh. Yeah. And do you remember I suggested that you pay a visit to the family planning clinic as part of a birthday packet to talk about uh, such matters. Oh, I don't remember that one. Mm, I remember. Your reaction was one of horror and shock. Yeah, well, there was practice from, uh, I found from that... me growling at you. No, I found that Peter has followed in his uncle Lee's footsteps and become an actor. He's grateful to his uncles and aunts, his grandparents and the nurturing Fangai system. I think it's a very, very good system. Who better to look after people in their old age than their own grandchildren? And also vice versa, then the grandchild also learns the values of, of you know, two generations back. Those values are kept alive. As far as I'm concerned, that's the way it should be.
Carrie also wants to keep the old values alive in her own way. She's given up her career and returned to live in the Carr family home at Rangitukia. Oh, oh, that's looking great. I just came home because I knew that what this old you? house needed someone to care for it and look after it and needed one of us living in here. And also because of the principle of te ahi ka, where you keep the home fires burning. Because it's no use standing in the halls of academia lecturing to hundreds of earnest students of Maoritanga about the principle of ahi ka, which is to have one of your family actually living on the land and keeping the home fires. gone out, the flame had almost gone out. Are uh, both in the cemetery, the family cemetery. Good old Bren. Told us to come home. Well, kua tai mai, ne. I couldn't see myself retiring in the city because for me there would be no focus. Uh, in a city. Here in Rangitukia, the focus is on the marae, the church, and the families around. I wonder nobody's drunk his whiskey. I <laughs> know you there. It's a nice long, isn't it? It's Cody. So there are Brad. We're back. Nice, isn't it? Anton Carr, Peter's cousin, lives in Auckland. His mother, Arapera, is the older sister of Keri and Wikuki. I think the cars are thinkers and they're fighters. When they eventually ask, oh, where are you from and who's your family, to be able to say, well, I'm from the East Coast and I'm a car, that's a really powerful statement. I've got a Swiss father who immigrated here about 40 years ago, and I have a Māori mother who's Arapera Ka. They were both creative, artistic people. When they met, Dad was a photographer and mum was at university and she wrote wonderful poetry was the first Māori to win a Catherine Mansfield award so on both sides they were amazing influences from parents who were both teachers although Rangitukia on the east coast is Anton's spiritual home he grew up in Northland and Auckland he felt different from other kids there isn't a moment when I wasn't aware of the fact that I liked men and that's as early as sort of five and six of being aware that I would, would watch men and watch boys. By the time I got to teenage years, it was abundantly clear that um, for me in my mind that I was physically attracted to men. It took me a long time to resolve. 25. When Anton was growing up in the 70s, hero parades were unheard of. Although there was a gay liberation movement, tried to fit in to straight society. Growing up as a gay teenager was difficult and it was something that I couldn't resolve. Um, I wanted to be the same as everybody else, which is really normal adolescent behaviour. I wanted to be the same and I wanted to fit in. And um, so, so, and then I became a born again Christian in my late teens. And that was my way of, um, I probably didn't see it at the time, but that was my way of trying to become normal. And um, I mean, there's absolutely nothing normal about being a born again Christian. But what it did, um, it did give me a place to hide and kind of avoid dealing with that issue. Anton's first sexual experience was loaded with guilt. His second was much more positive and sealed his future. Like I had been told for ages that, you know, being gay is unnatural. And I remember that you know, after this sort of meeting this man and sort of heading off afterwards, just feeling quite sort of euphoric that it was the most natural thing I'd ever done. You know, that no matter what people told me, I know what I felt with that. I just had to tell mum and it took me about six weeks to build up the courage. Her response was initially um, very good. So she did all the compassionate Māori things um, and sort of, you know, cried with me and sort of made me feel good. But uh, shortly after that, it became more difficult for Mum. And I remember one very emotional scene where she 
it was sort of burst into tears and sort of said that she had tried to deal with it but she couldn't and why did I give in and it's just not right and all this sort of thing which was really amazing because mum was this liberal thinking woman who had talked with Dyke. Family, there was enormous amount of grief and a lot of that grief was over the fact that it was highly unlikely that I would procreate and that's another thing I discovered is that you know the most important thing you can give the whānau is a mukapuna and um, they get very excited about that and the thought of um, you know me not procreating was just devastating for mum. But it was a real learning curve for me in terms of being Māori and I think it's a very different dynamic um, if you're gay and Māori because there is that whole sense of there's a whole whānau that you take with you. In the 1990s, being gay is far more accepted and gay couples even feature in television ads. Although for Anton, the single life holds more attraction. Being single is definitely an option nowadays and I, I enjoy it. Um, I mean, in saying that, you know, I haven't had sort of suitors bashing my door down, <laughs> wanting to sort of um, set up home with me, but I... Uh, you know, I must say that most relationships I see, um, even the good ones, seem to be incredibly hard work. And um, I'd need to be convinced that it was worthwhile before I kind of made that step. Changed sexual attitudes had also overtaken the McGibbon family. John and Liz have accepted behaviour from their children that would have brought down the wrath of their own parents. John and Liz McGibbon have relaxed, close relationships with their three sons and daughter, Suzanne. She's um, a very good friend of mine. Yeah. I, would, I would tell my mum more than I would probably tell um, my best friend. Well, I guess my mum is my best friend. I probably I speak to her, um, go to her for advice, just enjoy talking to her. I guess in general we were pretty laid back with the kids. I mean, I think we trusted them to a fair degree and trusted that they had a fair amount of common sense and uh, we knew that if we started to push them in ways too hard they would probably rebel and be far worse than they ever appeared to be anyways. The leather strap was banished in the McGibbon household. Go to your room. <laughs> yeah, that was generally it. There may have been, um, you know, go to your room without your dinner would be the most vicious, but yeah, no. No hardcore smacking or anything like that. We certainly didn't belong to the never smack a child. We used time out, I suppose, to a certain extent. Please go and stay out of my sight for a little while till I've got control of myself. I didn't have curfews. I didn't have, um, you know, parents constantly asking where I've been going, what I've been doing. I guess I was determined not to ever hound them and, and hover over them as I felt that I had been. My mother gave me a book on a book on you know you know puberty um, female puberty and I, I I mean I can remember my dad saying things like oh you know when you're, you're a child you go oh sex yucky dad would say something like oh you might enjoy it one day or you know he'd, he'd say something really flippant like that so that it wasn't a secret it wasn't you know don't talk about that kind of thing. He'd just say a flippant comment that, that fitted in, but was, didn't lead to anything, didn't stop there either. Um, yeah, so it was just open. Dad gave me the conversation about keeping myself safe <laughs> on a number of occasions. Obviously, Dad didn't want to be a grandfather before time. But at one stage, when, when it looked like she was in a very serious relationship with a boy, in fact, I did actually hand her some condoms. I said, if you are going to do it, make sure you're protected. <laughs> And I um, quickly grabbed them and threw them in my drawer and pretended he hadn't done it and <laughs> then took them out later. And <laughs> I felt a little, little bit funny about uh, doing it, but no, I had no great problems at all. I mean, by that stage, it, the condom culture was, was in. Um, it was acceptable to talk about condoms and uh, probably wasn't all that usual for fathers to give them to daughters, but I thought it seemed to be the reasonable thing to do at the time. Rather have a bit of embarrassment than have her pregnant. <laughs> By the 1980s, parental control of teenage behaviour was being challenged by peer pressure. There would be more pressure than probably would have been to get roaring drunk. The two often went together, um, you know, at parties and things, but yeah. But the pressure was definitely from, you know, from girls, yeah. 
and it's and I think it was an example of you know how cool are you? What what social group are you in? Um, yeah, how popular are you? Because hmm. it was I mean it, it wasn't just a matter I don't think in high school of just going out with somebody. It was also whether you're having sex with them. Sue's initiation happened when she was in her late teens, but it wasn't a big deal. What when I first had sex? Um, Seventeen. Mum and Dad might not know that, so I guess they will soon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's such a build-up when you're growing up that, you know, you've got to get it out of the way. Compared with some of her peers, Sue's first experience was late. The third form age, fourth form age, you could, you know, you could brand people that were, were spouting that they'd had sex sluts. Yeah. And, and we, in my group, we probably would, because um, we'd be interested in it, but not quite emotionally ready to um, do it. So we probably would consider people that were, you know, doing it. Um, but more, more, more than doing it, open about it, um, sluts, yeah. But then you sort of hit the sixth form age, and it all of a sudden changes. You know, you're not a slut anymore, you're actually quite cool. <laughs> The Gears had experienced mixed success at marriage, but even so, it remained a goal handed down through the generations. Lynn taught Lisa, the daughter she had with the first husband, Craig, the traditional customs of marriage. My mum sort of bred into us girls that you had to have a glory box for when you get married, so that you've got lots of nice goodies. And um, <laughs> I can remember at the age of 10, getting a kitchen whiz for my birthday, <laughs> thinking, shit, what is this? All my friends are getting clothes and makeup and things like that. And I got a kitchen whiz and an egg beater to put in my glory box. Lisa joined the Navy as a nurse, had a wonderful time on her OE, and then she met Andrew. Well, I reckon she seduced me. He, he probably says I seduced him, but he seduced me. <laughs> When Lisa walked down the aisle, she did it her way, by having two escorts. She had good relationships with both Craig, her natural father, and Wes, her stepfather. I thought they could both give me away, and that was really special. Yeah, I really meant a lot, and I think it meant a lot to Wes as well, to think that he treats us as his daughters, and I think, well, I needed to treat him as my father as well. Yeah. While marriage is no longer expected of couples, it is still popular although the timing is a matter of personal choice. We'd been living together for quite some time when we got married. Um, we'd been living together for about three years. And I think that's just that extra sort of commitment to each other. Tradition. Um, I mean, they say it's only a certificate, but then again, it sort of cements your relationship as well. And at the wedding breakfast, the groom announces that the bride is pregnant. <laughs> We planned we'd want to have children, but hopefully after the wedding, but it happened before, so yeah, that was fine. Sort of pregnancy before marriage is nothing now. It doesn't really matter what, whether you've got a piece of paper to say that the baby's legitimate. I mean, it's, he's still a baby and he's still, yeah, our son. My mum and everything thought it was fantastic, but my grandmother found it very difficult. Yeah, I think in her generation it's not, it's not, it's frowned upon to be pregnant when you get married. What was the head circumference? 35 centimetres. Baby Jared arrived to the great delight of his assembled family, including grandmas and great-grandmas. Father Andrew caught it all on camera. He's had a hands-on role ever since. I think we very much share the roles around the home. Like, we both do cleaning and stuff like that. Um, I think that's it was really good when I met Andrew that he knew how to clean. Yeah. <laughs> no, he does a lot for Jared. Um, I eat meals because he says I'm a better cook than him. But um, he, he does cook um, sometimes. In the 1990s, sexual experimentation stretched the old boundaries. Sue McGibbon, like many of her generation, was exploring relations with men on her own terms. If you meet somebody at a pub, you tend to go home with them. You know, if you've been drinking, you know, you've met them, you're obviously chatting each other up. You do often, you know, tend to go home with them. I have had one night stands and I'm comfortable in them, with them in terms of, I felt like doing it at the time, but in retrospect, I kind of think, well, it wasn't actually the best idea. 
because it's not it's not safe. Um, I've always been really pedantic about using condoms, so I personally was you know was safe at the time. But nothing's ever 100% safe, so yeah, I, I do think in this day and age, you you need to be a lot more careful than probably I and my friends have been. Things changed when Sue met Paolo, a Portuguese in a London pub. We just hung out as friends for a long time. Um, for, for, you know, for a couple of months, we were pretty much just friends. This courtship occurred at a more measured pace. Six weeks passed before Sue and Paolo slept together. That was all his choice, not mine. <laughs> he couldn't, he claims he couldn't read me. I mean, it ended up being an ongoing joke with my flatmate and I. You know, every time I came home, she'd ask for the lowdown. And I'd go, well, there's no lowdown to give you. <laughs> And, um, I mean, it ended up being just an ongoing joke, and it's an ongoing joke between the three of us, um, still. This, this proper courtship that we had. Um, yeah, because I've never had a proper courtship before. Well, now, now my daughter, uh, Susanna, and Paolo, her fiancé, have been living together now for the best part of three or four years, and that doesn't worry me one little bit. I think that I would prefer that they not live together first. Certainly, John seems to think that, you know, a bit of a trial is, is a good idea to see if, if you get on well. It wasn't particularly my opinion, and I made my opinion known, but that was her choice, and I certainly wasn't um, going to come overall moral about it. Sue's great uncle is not so accepting of the values of the younger generation. You make your rely on it. And if they think they get something out of it, that's over to them. But it's, uh, it's in some ways, it's a tragedy. Uh, you never find a real happiness in those unattached things you do against the marriage. There's something in the marriage that is, is very important very important, which they don't get living loosely or anything like that. If Sue's courtship was traditional, so too is the household division of roles between her and Paolo. At the moment, I bloody do just about all of it. <laughs> what amuses me is that I, I um, sort of through the, the late teens, early 20s, it was all women are going to, you know, it's, I'm going to be in a 50-50 relationship. He's going to do as much housework as I am, but the reality of it is, it's just not like that. Women are still doing more housework. They're still, still doing, still doing all of the jobs that the little elves go and do, you know? You know, if something's done, it doesn't just bloody get done, it's because someone's done it. <laughs> and that person generally is the female. Because men are useless. <laughs> You can have that on TV. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, you no, know, I do know that's what it is. <laughs> no. I think women are still brought up to be giving. They're still brought up to be caring. They're still brought up to look after people. And we, we try and pretend that we're not brought up that way, but we are. They are getting married now, and I'm pleased they are getting married. I believe that um, if you're going to have children in a, in a union, that uh, they're probably better off in a married situation. I think the parents will make a little bit more of an effort to uh, to keep make the marriage work. I sit down and take you, Paul, across the, to be my husband. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, and I will love you and honour you all the days of my life. Some old-fashioned values have survived. Despite her modern attitudes to sexuality, Sue has a traditional belief in commitment. That's my belief on marriage. There's a very clear message to you and to everybody else that you intend on staying together, you intend on being um, married and living together as a, you know, in a partnership for the rest of your life. But for me, personally, I'm getting married with the intention of staying married. Otherwise, I wouldn't get married. New Zealand families have changed dramatically over the last hundred years. There's more diversity and more tolerance of different kinds of relationships. 
In some ways, Pākehā families have become more like Māori families. They've relaxed, although the obligations are still there. Traditions that have survived have done so because they work, not because people must conform to a rigid moral code. As we move into the 21st century, the family, in all its rich variety, has survived because for all its complications, it offers love, support, and a place to stand in the world.